You know what? We take this rig down the road on Fridays. That's right. Uh, we're here, and we're going to get a chance to visit with you. We've got a lot of people lined up. Bill Werner is going to join us. There was a big shooting in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, I was visiting with a, a good friend of mine over whether or not uh, he would want to be in downtown Minneapolis at night. And it's it's a conversation that people are having. Uh, it really is. Also, Doug Lear is going to join us. Tomorrow is the pheasant opener. Uh, and that that's uh, like a holiday with me, to be able to uh, to get out there. The, the, the pheasant opener and the deer opener, that, that isn't even a debate at our house. That's just you get out there and you get after it. And it's it's something that you look at with all your friends and, and you know, you, you just schedule it. You just schedule it. And, and then there's the next generation, too. I mean, uh, my nephew, who grew up hunting around me, and I grew up hunting around his dad, uh, my nephew's kids are now in their uh, early 20s and late teens, and they're going to be with us. And so that's kind of cool as well, to be able to, to just sit down and talk to them and uh, just get a chance to get out and get hunting. And, and maybe shoot a couple birds, but the fun isn't determined on whether or not you shoot a lot of birds. That being said, we're going to shoot some birds. Uh, I really feel like we are. Uh, Stan Tequila is going to join us in just a little bit. We're going to get a chance to visit with him. Now, Stan is an author and a wildlife photographer. Um, you know, th there are so many things I think we don't know about the outdoors and, and where we live. And when it comes to, you know, wildlife, when it comes to birds, you know, Stan is somebody who does know. And so Stan Tequila has been a, a person we've counted on on radio for a long, long time. If you want to see his work, you go to naturesmart.com. I think I've got that right, naturesmart.com. But we'll find out when we get a chance to, to visit with Stan in, in just a little bit, um, in, in large part because the migratory birds are coming through, right? In fact, we've already been goose hunting for a while. So uh, let's see if we can tie in with them. Stan, good to have you coming down the road with us. Hey, good. Uh, well, I guess it's afternoon now, huh? Yeah, yeah, it is. So uh, afternoon sliding into that nighttime. That's what I like. Um, <laughs> so Stan, want to get a chance to visit with you about, uh, you know, Minnesota, North Dakota, you know, South Dakota, the people that are watching you right now with the migratory birds and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the work that you do. Describe what NatureSmart.com is all about. So naturesmart.com is me, <laughs> one man show. I do a variety of different things. Uh, first and foremost, I'm trained as a um, wildlife biologist from the University of Minnesota. And um, I'm a naturalist and a naturalist is really somebody who teaches or educates about the great big world around us. It may be about the plants, animals, whatever it may be, um, and a little bit of everything. So a jack of uh, all trades and a master of none. And uh, I do this through a variety of different ways. I have a syndicated newspaper column. I have a, um, uh, I write books. So uh, my first book came out about 35 years ago. And since then I've written about uh, a little over 200 books. In fact, you caught me, hold on. You <laughs> caught me editing, editing a second. Birds of edition. California, I see. Birds of California. So I have to go through this entire, I, I have to redo update. Well, that's what you get like for that. being good at it, Stan. You know, yeah. that, that's yeah. exactly what you get for being good at it. So True. Are, are birds your main focus? Well, it's all wildlife, but you know what? There is a, um, <clears throat> a lot of people are really into birds. So I kind of, um, you know, kind of move around with that. Right about this time of year, mushrooms are a big topic right now. And I have a, a, a really nice book on mushrooms called Start Mushrooming. It's a, kind of the easiest way to go out and start finding and collecting edible mushrooms and not kill yourself. So, I had one of my best friends, Stan, when I was growing up, his dad would go out with a gunny sack and he had this mm -hmm. double secret place uh, yes. where he would go mushrooming. And he wouldn't yeah. tell anybody about it. He wouldn't. Yes. And, and another one who I know you know, Jack Sunday from the radio station, he had friends uh, that, mm -hmm. that would mushroom. And he went with them one time, and they blindfolded him. Yes. Uh, did he tell you about that one time? So, <laughs> no, but this is common practice amongst the mushroomers. Right. So. We, we had the, the first example I gave you, uh, that, that was a gentleman named Joe Haitmonic. He was, he was bohemian, loved his mushrooms, and, uh, and yeah. he, he, people found out where he went. 
And I don't think I've ever seen that guy as mad as what I did then. I mean, these spots to them are private yeah. and they're religious almost. Dad. Yeah, it's worse than the best fishing holes. I mean, <laughs> way worse. Yeah. I mean, what what yeah. I found out, because in the end his son showed me, was a lot of it had to do with dead cottonwood trees. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that follows through with some of what you're teaching people. Well, uh, the mushrooms are a finite type of thing they only come up you know once or twice a year it's not like fishing where they're you know available year round or something like that and so people are really guarded of their mushroom patches and they and you know they're they're good they're a delicacy they you know they taste great and so on and so forth so people really really kind of guard their their mushroom areas um at, that's usually in the springtime in the fall um they're because in the springtime it's usually just morel mushrooms and everybody kind of guards their little patch of morels in the fall there's a variety of different um uh mushrooms you can collect and so it's a little less stringent a little more open and more <laughs> welcoming and inviting for other people too so it's um and you can you can collect a, a number of really good things you can collect several pounds worth of mushrooms if the weather's right you know if we get enough uh, moisture and all that so it's a it's a good thing uh to have and you, however, having said this, now look, it's really important to understand that um, uh, you gotta know what you're doing because if you don't, uh, you you can kill yourself. Right. And if you you eat the wrong mushroom, there's no saying, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'll do better next time." <laughs> um, you know. That, so you that's be, right. I mean, they yeah. were, they were really guarded uh, in terms of what they would give to somebody, or you know, they didn't pick the bad ones, uh, but mm -hmm. other people because they loved what they had. You know, mm -hmm. they would go out there and give it a try. And uh, I don't know that it ever killed anybody. I know it got some people really sick. I do. <laughs> um, every year, there's one or two who um, uh, think that they know what they're doing and collect the wrong types and, and uh, poison themselves. And it's a it's a real trick. So um, here, here's a kind of, um, a, I don't know, I don't want to call it a hint. I, I just want to call it a, a blatant, obvious thing. If it looks... Like if it's growing in your lawn and it looks like a store-bought white button mushroom, and you're so familiar with it, r run away because <laughs> those are the most deadly of all the ones. Those are the ammonitas, and they are the ones that are like crazy deadly. One square centimeter of its flesh is enough to kill an adult human. So you got to be really, really careful with these things. By the way, everybody who's ever eaten uh, deadly poisonous mushrooms um t said that they tasted great so yeah all those yeah all those old uh, kind of wives tales of um things like oh if you if you take a little tiny bit of it and and it's bitter then it's not good N false that's just not true or if you cook it with a silver spoon and the spoon turns black then it's poison no not true there are, there's just no way of like a, an easy test to get edible mushrooms uh or detect poisonous mushrooms other than knowing the species and knowing what you're doing that's the only way to do it well it, and it, this is why it's so much fun to, to visit with you and to listen to you and probably why it's so much fun to go to naturesmart.com is because i didn't call you up to talk about mushrooms yeah uh, I, but, <laughs> but but i was the just thinking that the truth of the matter is i could sit and talk to you about it all day just because of the <laughs> you know the the people I, I had in my past that have gone to the great beyond and i don't see people doing i know that one of the mushroom patches i promised this last one but one mushroom patches that yeah. uh, that the gentleman I was talking about used got plowed under, and okay. he was kicking pebbles for weeks. I mean, he mm. was he he actually got into it with the farmer about how land hungry he is. You, you had to just get that last <laughs> twenty acres, didn't you? And mm -hmm. and he, he you know I remember the farmer looking at him and saying, "Well, I do own it." <laughs> you know, <laughs> Stan, I live by a lake, and uh, yeah. and every spring it's like um, it, it's an North Dakota lake. And it's a okay. small lake. It's only 400 mm -hmm. acres, spring-fed type of a lake. Not a lot of uh, structure type of a deal. But, you know, w one, of the, uh, one of the things we look for the most during the spring, and I know what they sound like and I know what they look like, is a loon. And, okay. um, and it comes by itself. There's never two. And mm -hmm. and so we've got different names for them, uh, <laughs> you know, names that would be obvious for a, a loon that's all alone. But the <laughs> truth of the matter is, 
We mm-hmm. just sit and, and die for him to come. And uh, mm-hmm. why would a, just for my own personal being, why would a loon ever come all by its safe self every spring to a lake? So when um, young loons are hatched, they, um, they, they spend their whole spring and summer on the lake. They can't fly yet. And then uh, about this time of year, about October, uh, the adult male and the adult female, the parents of that young, have already migrated. They've already left. And when, uh, uh, so this is a kind of a, I mean, not even a one-year-old bird who is, has to teach themselves how to fly. So they have to build muscle and teach themselves how to fly. Once they're airborne, once they're flying, then they will start their own migration. Now, how do they know where they're going and how do they know when they've got there that they've, they're in the right place is still a mystery. But then these young birds go down to, um, about 90% of our birds go to the Gulf of Mexico. And they will spend three years down there before they return home. And then when they return home, they almost always return home to their natal lake, the lake that they were born on. And, of course, if mom and dad are there, they're like, you know, take a hike, Junior. Where You know, mom and dad are here. Take, you know, find your own place. So then those younger birds, three, four, five-year-old birds, start spreading out and going different directions, and they will end up looking for you know, new places to uh, be. And so apparently you've got one who's, you know, kind of hoping against hope that uh, it, he's going to find another young opposite sex bird going to show up and they're going to, you know, claim this area. And it, that's not uncommon because the birds really, these loons don't get reproductively active until they're about five or six years of, of age. And then, the, the, so it's probably just waiting for, for a, an opportunity to come along, <laughs> aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> St- Stan, Sorry. In, 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 well, it's true. Uh, Stan, in, in, in terms of the bird I'm talking about, I, here we are, uh, statewide mm-hmm. TV talking about one loon out of all the loons out there. But the bird <laughs> I'm talking about, he doesn't hang around. Uh, all that long, oh, you know, probably yeah. a month, something yeah. like that. So yeah. what's going on there? Is so, he... so they're lo- so it's waiting, and then when it's, it gets past the uh, you know nesting time, it will um, then move on to other areas to finish out the summer, and uh, into other areas that perhaps got better fish or uh, there's other loons around or so on and so forth. So uh, if they're unsuccessful for that year, then they'll move on to another lake, uh, okay. and then just kind of hang out. The thing is with these with these birds, and, and this is something that I think that people don't get right away, and that is they are they are unique individuals with a set of experiences that guide what they do and how they do it. And so they're all they're just like people in that they all have we we as people we oftentimes think as wildlife as automatrons, these wind up toys that do exactly the same type of action and behavior over and over again, which is not even close to being true. They are unique individuals who do different things, and it is just how how it is. And so this one individual is basically running its life based on its past experiences and what it's done before and what's been successful and what hasn't been successful, so on and so forth. That's so, interesting because, yeah. you know, last time I looked, and, and, and ponder this uh, before we come back, uh, the Gulf of Mexico was salt water. And so when yes. you said the Gulf of Mexico, I was like, what? So uh, hang with us, folks, because I don't know if you're enjoying this as much as I am, but if you're not, you should. Uh, more with Stan Tequila right after this as we head down the road. Stan Tequila is still with us. And I got to tell you, any man with the last name Tequila is a, a friend <laughs> of mine in the first place. Uh, but he is, well, if you want to go to his website and find out more, just go to naturesmart.com. We were talking about the loon. Uh, before we went on break. And when you turned in tonight for Down the Road, it's probably the last thing you thought we were going to be talking about, but you're enjoying it, aren't you? Because there's things that you just don't know. And Stan, I didn't know that they head down to the Gulf of Mexico uh, in their migration process, because to me, if you'd have had me guess, I mean, that's that's salt water. So explain this to me. Great, great insight on your part, by the way. So kudos to you, because a lot of people don't even give that a second thought. Um, but birds are are usually, and all animals are usually, very uh, habitat specific. So, for example, these bird, you know, the loons are born 
raised spend all their time in fresh water to be able to switch over to salt water is really very unusual and it doesn't happen very often uh, just a handful of birds can do this and um, it involves uh, an excess in salt intake uh, when they're down on the Gulf of, of Mexico in the salt water and they have specialized glands uh, that are near their nares, near their nose, that excretes out the salt um, as they're going along. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to handle that much salt as it's coming in. And so it's, um, it's a really a unique thing for them to do. Once they hit the gulf, by the way, so if it's a, if it's a juvenile bird and it just arrived, say, for example, it was hatched this uh, spring and it arrives, say, you know, mid-October, November, down in the Gulf of Mexico, it will spend up to three years on that salt water, and it rarely flies. By the way, and it doesn't look like an adult loon either. It's all gray. So uh, even the adults in the wintertime don't have that formal black and white, you know, formal wear on. They're all gray in the wintertime. Um, and I always like to say, look, if you're not trying to impress, why dress up, right? You know, so that's kind of my... my um... I, I guess I, I never thought of that. I, you know, yeah. the, the beauty, the two things about a loon that you love is is the coloring and the sound. You sound. Know, I've been in a lot of sloughs getting after a lot of birds in my life. And, and yeah. I'm not going to lie to you, Stan. I mean, as a young uh, kid in high school, a lot of times I didn't know the difference between certain ducks that I was getting after. You know, and that's, I think, one of the failings of, of duck hunting. But uh, the loon, I knew. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. knew what it looked like. I knew what it sounded like. And uh, so to, to find out that it doesn't fly at all and turns gray, I'm almost pouting yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so then they'll spend they'll spend a lot of time swimming. Actually, they'll swim up the whole east coast, and they'll, as they're fishing along, they'll go up the whole east coast. They've got new transmitters. You can do a Google search on this and find these uh, websites where they've got transmitters on these uh, loons, and it shows that where they're going to at different times. And it's absolutely fascinating to watch that they'll swim up the east coast, and then swim back down, and then and, you know, and it'll take them a year to do this, and then they'll start heading back towards Minnesota when they're of breeding age, too. Okay. Uh, so it's quite unusual. Stan, I'm not going to let you go without getting a chance to talk about where I'm going to be this weekend. On Saturday morning, I'm going to be out there getting after the pheasants. It's the pheasant opener, and I think a lot of people don't know the oh, yeah. history of the pheasant itself. So uh, explain that to people. Well, North and South Dakota, of course, are you know home to, uh, to pheasants and People absolutely love hunting them. The pheasant is a non-native bird uh, brought here from Eurasia and uh, is propagated for hunting opportunities. And so it's it's an interesting bird. I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. A lot of people don't realize there are many different types of pheasants, too. There's Lady Amherst pheasants, pheasants there's uh, emerald pheasants. There's a bunch of different types of pheasants. We uh, kind of concentrate on the ring-necked pheasant. This is, it's called a ring neck because it has a white ring around its neck. <clears throat> and this is a bird that's um, kind of, you know, raised in captivity, usually released out into the wild. And then there are wild ones that reproduce. And it, uh, you know, allows for that great upland hunting uh, opportunities. Well, well, when you think about pheasants, there's a couple things I, I think about is it, early in the season, uh, we're going to see them hold tighter. We're going to see them tomorrow where the dogs are going to be able to get them up. And uh, later in the season, what we're going to call them what we always do, which is the, the birds are getting really wild. Uh, is that accurate? Because or I've smart. been present hunting for smart. There's, there's yeah. a better way of putting it. But th they can learn that we're after them uh, throughout the season, Stan. Oh, yes. Oh, they'll learn very quickly. And, uh, you, you know, even if they're just birds from this, you know, this past season that hatched, they will learn. Uh, what's going on like that, and they will stick closer to the ground, do more traveling on the ground, running on the ground, that type of thing, and it takes more effort to, to get them up in the air, uh, for sure. So, so they're, they're smart birds. So let me ask you this, in, in terms of watching the dogs work, you know, you try to keep them close in front of you and, and all of that, but they'll get on to a bird that just took off running sometimes. The good ones mm -hmm. you'll be able to call back, keep them working in front of you, the bad ones, gone. Uh, the dogs mm -hmm. that you're just training, that type of thing. What are what are pheasants more apt to do? To run away from you or fly away from you? At first, their their first uh, inclination is to fly away. But as they've learned, then they'll start to the run away uh, after that. Um, I always like to say that birds have wings and they know how to use them. So uh, and they'll use them when they need to. And and it's a it's it's as natural as you and I. Uh, being able to walk and those birds will fly when needed and, and how needed if there's not a lot of cover for them 
uh, they'll fly. If there's lots of cover, they'll they'll run. Uh, you know, so they can stay hidden that most of that time too. So, it's a it's an interesting thing. Um, I do find it a little interesting that. Um, we as a society have really kind of poured uh, lots of efforts into pheasants when in fact we've got sharp-tailed grouse and greater prairie chickens which are our native species that nobody seems to go after or if they do it's a very or you know, or even rough grouse that type of thing it's a very different type of um, um, hunting environment if you will so it's uh, it's interesting to see uh, the differences there I, I've hunted all the things that you just said and when it comes to to birds uh, you know I've I, I used to have a network of of people that just they grew up on on Canadian geese and mallard yeah. and all of that. And so when I used to do a lot of uh, waterfall hunting, I would take those to those individuals, probably two generations above me. And I'd pull into the driveway with a with the feathers still on a, a honker, and they just loved it. They thought they mm -hmm. died and went to heaven. Mm -hmm. The sad part for me is, you know, a lot of them have passed away. And mm -hmm. so the network of people that I can give them to that enjoy eating them uh, is gone to me. But, it, yeah. <laughs> pick, pick me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll bring you some. I will. <laughs> but, but here's the thing for me. Pheasants, dove, I'll eat those two all day long. And I'm not mm -hmm. a big grouse fan. I'm not. But pheasants mm -hmm. and dove, man, they're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that, I'm that kind of a, I don't know, strange character that uh, I don't like killing anything, um, but I love eating it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of that, I don't know, I'm kind of like that uh, a, a contradiction, if you will. Um, I just, I always joke and say when they were giving out the killing gene, I was out bird watching because I didn't get it. <laughs> you know? Stan, Stan, can we do this again sometime? I would love to. Stan Tequila, ladies and gentlemen. Again, naturesmart.com. You're going to see a lot of publications. You're going to be see a lot of great photography, and you're going to see a passion in his life. So, Stan, good to have you coming down the road with us.